I want to build a meat laser, as in a laser made of living animal cells. Why? Because, let's be honest, those Cyclops powers aren't going to make themselves, and I'm the only bioengineer on YouTube crazy enough to try. And I have a theory on how to make it work, but first, I need to build a few things in order to test that theory out. So today, we're going to do just that. Let me explain. This is Rhodamine 6G. It is a beautiful and highly fluorescent chemical that has a very special property. If you shine enough UV light on it, it will emit laser light. And not only that, but you can change the color of the light with just the turn of a screw if you set things up properly, though I am getting ahead of myself. Lasers that can be made this way are called dye lasers, and Rhodamine 6G isn't unique in its lasing ability. There are many dyes that come in a wide range of tunable colors, making them very versatile. But Rhodamine is the easiest to get this to work with. We just need a source of UV light intense enough. Enter this pile of junk on my desk, which is actually a high-power UV laser. It might not look like much when it's off, but it's the most powerful laser I own with the ability to put out 100 kilowatt pulses. Though it's so far into the UV that you can't see the beam and neither can my camera. If I put a solution of dye in front of it though, suddenly the beam is visible. It can be made almost entirely from stuff you might have around the house, but it is also incredibly dangerous as it uses intense high voltages to operate. Combine a dye like rhodamine and this type of laser and you've got a recipe for, theoretically, a nice and straightforward dye laser. So how does this fit into the meat laser dream? Well, I have a theory. You see, theoretically, any highly fluorescent chemical should be able to laze in a dye laser. But what if that chemical was actually a protein? Like, for example, green fluorescent protein. This is a protein where its function is really what's written on the tin. It's a protein, and when you shine a UV light on it, it glows green. What makes this different than rhodamine is that you can change the color of the protein by just changing its sequence. Proteins are a long chain of specially ordered amino acids. Changing even a single one changes the shape and function of the protein, even if only a little bit. Because of this, you can get fluorescent proteins in literally every color. And some look just as bright as the laser dyes when you shine a light on them. And I maintain a huge collection of genetically engineered E. coli that can produce a wide range of these colors in an easy-to-grow and extract form. Let's not get into the details of why I maintain that collection. I'm a mad scientist. Don't overthink it. What's he doing? What's he crafting? I can craft stuff too, pal! The other thing that's special about proteins is that if I want a different color, all I need is the code for the color I want. When a scientist finds or makes a new color of these sorts of proteins, they will often add them to online databases or publish the sequence of the protein so that other researchers can use them. I can now go onto a site like FPBase that collects this information and just grab the code for the color I want. Then, like I've shown in previous videos, I can use that code to generate a piece of DNA that will allow cells to produce that protein. Then I just order the DNA from a supplier, load it into something like E. coli bacteria, and then grow as much of the protein as I want. It's a pretty cool process, so I've put links below to videos on how all of that works. Now think about what this all implies if green fluorescent protein and the rest of these colorful proteins can laze. You would have a genetically programmable protein laser. And since it's almost as easy to modify animal cells to produce green fluorescent protein instead of E. coli, theoretically, you could build a meat laser. If the cells are engineered to survive the intense UV pulse and produce a high enough amount of protein, the living cells themselves could act as the lasing medium. And the thing is, there are papers to back this insanity up from groups that have actually done basically that. But those papers only ever did it on a micro scale. I want a full laser beam. But for that to work, we first need a functioning dye laser, and since that part alone took us between six months and six years, depending on how you're measuring, we figured it was probably best that we pause here and share the progress we've made and all the things we've learned about dye lasers. Then, with that working tool in hand, next time we can focus on growing and purifying fluorescent proteins in our new bioreactors, and be able to directly test them in an already working dye laser. If that works, then we can use our new meat cubator to grow and modify animal cells, and the meat laser will be most of the way done. So let's get to it and start building. We'll of course be starting with the garbage laser. The proper name for this is a TEA, or transversely excited air laser. All it is, is two straight metal rails and some capacitors. They're set up in such a way that when the capacitors discharge, all of their energy is forced to jump between the rails. This ionizes the gas, turning it all to plasma for just a moment. Before we get further, let's quickly review how all lasers work. The short version is that you have some medium, be it a crystal or a liquid or a gas, and you input a bunch of energy. This raises the electrons in these special materials up to a higher energy. Think of it like pulling the bar back on a mousetrap. The medium wants to release the energy, but it needs a little bit of a nudge to do so. 
That nudge comes from photons passing through the charged up medium. As they fly through, they make nearby electrons shed their energy and emit photons of the same wavelength and in the same direction as the incident photon. This creates a cascade as the newly made photons trigger more and more to be released until the medium has spent all of its energy. Normally, you need what's called a laser cavity, where you put mirrors on either side of the lasing medium so that light can bounce back and forth through the length of it, stimulating more and more light to be released in the same direction and as the same color. But with TEA lasers, the medium is so unstable it causes all of the gas to shed its energy fairly efficiently even without mirrors. In the case of the TEA laser, the thing that's actually doing the lasing is the nitrogen atoms which make up about 70% of the air. But these lasers aren't limited to just using nitrogen. Nitrogen gives a nice UV emission, but subbing it out for CO2 for example makes for a very powerful infrared beam instead. Before we assemble ours, I should mention that there are a lot of other great videos already on YouTube about these lasers. Styropyro, Les's Lab, and Plasma Channel all have excellent videos on the topic if you want to learn more about them. I've linked to those below, but there are many, many more. There's actually a couple different ways to build these lasers, but having tried them all and burned many hours assembling and disassembling various versions, what I'll show you is the most foolproof method that is still very efficient. We built a beautiful and intricately engineered version, only to find out that after hours of machining and days of tinkering that the lasers made from trash seem to work way better. It's not to say that they're the most efficient, but the ease of construction and getting them to actually work makes up for any losses in power. That said, while I'll show all the details for educational purposes, I wouldn't recommend anyone actually build one of these things. They are incredibly dangerous, the voltages are very lethal, they are extremely loud, and produce incredibly intense pulses of laser light. So again, this is for educational purposes, please don't actually try this. Here is the circuit diagram of the laser. To get started, we need a metal base plate. Here we're using an aluminum plate, but a big sheet of aluminum foil works too. Then we lay on top of it an acetate transparency sheet to act as an insulator, leaving one edge of the bottom foil exposed slightly. Then we add two more pieces of foil on top arranged like so, leaving at least a one inch gap from the edge of the transparency film. This creates our pair of capacitors. To form our laser channel, we place two pieces of hex bar so that they form a long, thin channel between the two upper pieces of foil. The top two capacitors also need to be electrically connected together, but we also want to make it difficult for electricity to flow without jumping between the rails. So we add an inductor made of a short length of wire, which I coiled around a pencil 15 or 20 times, then bent into an arc and held down onto the foils with a few large nuts. I like to hot glue two long wooden or plastic sticks to one of the rails so that they can be easily adjusted without having to actually touch them and risk electrocution. Next we need a power source. We'll be using a flyback transformer driven by a ZVS driver which we got on Amazon. This puts out about 40,000 volts, but it does so as pulses of DC electricity. To smooth those pulses out so that it's flatter DC, we added a capacitor between the positive and negative. We're using a homemade doorknob style capacitor that we made from a standard high voltage cap. It's got bolts on the ends and is potted in epoxy to help prevent sparking. We had it left over from the more elaborate form of laser that we tried to build. Now we connect the negative to the exposed bottom piece of foil and the positive to this foil here. The last thing we need is a spark gap between the bottom layer of foil and the top layer. This is our wildly over-engineered version. While we absolutely could have just used two bolts with some acorn nuts on them, originally we planned on using a pressurized spark gap. Spark gaps work because air has what's called a breakdown voltage, which is the amount of voltage required for electrons to just fly through the air without a wire. But that voltage is set by the pressure. Increasing the pressure increases the voltage needed for a spark to form. Since this spark gap also controls the firing rate of the whole laser, we can then control the firing rate and how much energy each pulse has by just raising or lowering the pressure. But that's it for assembly. Now again, I wouldn't actually recommend building one of these as they are super dangerous, but if you're going to, these are the dimensions of all of the different parts that we used. Now to make this actually work, you adjust the voltage and the rails until everything is aligned perfectly. This can take a while, but once you get a feel for it, you can build the complete setup and achieve lasing in only a few minutes. Sometimes it helps to run the rails over some 2000 grit sandpaper on a really flat surface to knock off any rough spots and make sure they're all super flat, smooth, and parallel. One of the things that makes this laser so dangerous is that it's a UV laser and so you can't see the beam, but the light is still there even if you can't see it. To help visualize it and know when things are lined up, I put a piece of paper in front of the laser channel, and when everything is aligned, there will suddenly be a bright, glowing spot every single pulse. 
But with our UV source done, we can finally make the dye laser. In theory, dye lasers are simple setups. You've got a UV light source, a lens to focus the light down into a thin beam, a container for the dye, and a pair of mirrors. One fully silvered, and one partially silvered so that some light can still escape. But here's where we hit a snag. This is one of those topics where you really need to know the right words to be searching for to get good information, but unless you already know about these sorts of lasers, you probably won't know the right words. For example, it's very hard to find good information about which dyes will laze easily, the amount of light required to make them fire, and the correct concentration of dye. After weeks of messing with it, we realized that we needed to start stripping back some variables to figure out what is and isn't working. So we 3D printed a much more adjustable mount for all the different components and bought a commercial nitrogen laser. It works basically the same way as the TEA laser we built, but it has a much more refined electrical system and, importantly, is in a nice, safe-to-be-around box. Also, it's computer-controlled, so I can set the firing rate and even the amount of energy in each pulse. This makes it much safer and easier to work around, especially in the dark. And since it literally has used for dye lasers written in the manual, it removes the light sources, the reason the dyes weren't firing. But if we wanted, now that we have things working, we could go back to the garbage laser. It's just loud and terrifying to be around, so we're going to stick with this one for now. The other snag was our choice of liquid container. When we started this, we were using these cheap polystyrene cuvettes, which you can get by the box, and in theory, they seemed perfect. Four clear sides, UV goes right through it, should be great. But what we didn't notice was that if you look down into the cuvette, there's these slight fillets in the corner. In this style of laser, the lasing happens in only about a millimeter or less of liquid right at the surface closest to the wall of the cuvette, which means that those fillets are directly in line with the laser light and will act like little prisms. So instead of a nice beam of laser light, you get a barely visible glow. Instead of amplification, all that light is being shot into the void, ruining the effect. When we finally caught on to that, we redesigned everything to use these homemade cuvettes made from microscope slides that we super glued together with the help of some 3D printed jigs. And while this worked relatively well, we eventually bit the bullet and bought some nice quartz cuvettes that are made specifically for this, which honestly we should have just done at the start. For the mirrors, we actually made our own using our Magnetron metal coating machine, but they just as easily can be bought online. Just look for first surface mirrors and 90 to 10 plate beam splitters, the latter being a partially silvered mirror that will let about 10% of the light through. Sites like Thor Labs carry all this kind of stuff for fairly cheap. The mirror mounts I got on eBay for about 50 bucks a piece, and they will allow the mirrors to be carefully adjusted in all three directions. As I mentioned before, the base to mount everything on was printed on our Prusa 3D printers, and there's a link below to all the 3D files we used in this project for anyone who happens to be following along. To focus the UV light into a tight beam, I bought a 25mm focal length quartz lens from Thor Labs. This has a spot in the 3D printed mount and even has a little adjustment arm to allow it to be carefully positioned to maximize how tight the beam is. To get this setup working, I highly recommend starting with Rotamine 6G. Saying it's the easiest to get to lays is an understatement. Just watch this. Even with no mirrors and just the lens to focus the UV light into the beam, if I hold the cuvette in my hand and move it into the focal point, laser beams come flying out the sides. Those beams are incredibly useful when trying to align the mirrors initially. Without them, you're basically aiming blind and many dyes just won't laze properly unless everything's lined up. Once things are trammed in, other dyes can be used as they often just need that mirror to amplify enough light in order to laze. This is why I can't start with the fluorescent proteins. One thing you may have noticed is that at the beginning I mentioned you could change the color of the laser. There are two ways to do that. The first is, of course, just changing what dye you're using. Another really good dye is 7-diethylamino-4-methylcumarin, which makes a lovely blue laser, though there are dozens of others to choose from. A fun quirk is that most of the chemicals used in highlighters that are fluorescent work really well in a system that's already trammed in. Here, for example, we have fluorescein, which is a green-yellow color. And here is rhodamine B, which you may recognize from pink highlighters, and is very similar to rhodamine 6G. And to save you a headache, here are all the concentrations that actually work. Though, a note, all of these must be dissolved in 99% ethanol to work properly. The other option for tuning the output color is to select the specific wavelength you want from each of these dyes. All of them actually have a range of wavelengths they're capable of emitting. When you use a normal mirror, the light emitted will just be a mix of all the different colors that the dye can emit. But if you replace the back mirror with a diffraction grating, things get a little more interesting. 
A diffraction grating splits light based on color. It's kind of like a sheet made out of prisms. When light hits it, different wavelengths will bounce off at different angles. So by having the grating here, depending on its angle, you can make specific colors be the only thing that is reflected back into the laser cavity. This will massively amplify that wavelength, so the beam coming out of the setup is confined to that color. By gently turning the screw on the mirror mount, you can move through the color range of the die. I've got to say, it was incredibly satisfying to see this finally work, and getting that nice color swing from the various dyes was amazing. Most of the lasers we're used to seeing are diode lasers, and those are limited to specific colors because of how they're made. That's why you usually only see the same small handful of colors. But with this, with the right dye, you can have whatever color you want or need for your experiment. Now imagine what will happen when we try the fluorescent proteins. If they laze, they often have a huge range of their emission spectrum. So with only a small number of proteins, you can make a laser whatever color you want, and when the dye is spent as it's damaged by the UV light, you can just grow more. And of course, if they laze, we are tantalizingly close to a full meat laser. We're already actively working on genetically modifying mouse cells for another project that you're going to see soon, so we may even have some GFP-expressing cells ready shortly once we dial in that protocol. If that all sounds exciting, then of course be sure to subscribe as there is lots more where this project came from. And of course, if you'd like to help us make more videos like this, patrons, channel members, and supporters on Kofi are a huge reason we can do projects like this, so a big thank you to them as always. And if you'd like to see these videos before everyone else, or hang out on our exclusive supporter discord, there's some links below. Before I wrap up, I leave you with this important question. Have you ever wanted to meet the amazing creators you watch on YouTube or see the projects we all build in person? Well, I've got some good news. This July from the 15th to the 16th in San Francisco, California, you can do just that at Open Source 2023. I'll be there along with some of the best creators on the platform, and I for one am so excited. Get your tickets now at the link below, and I hope to see many of you there. There will be exhibits, talks, panels, and sessions with many of your favorite creators, as well as a huge exhibition space filled with demos and displays. Creators are flying in from literally all over the world, so it's going to be a great event. For more info, see the links below. But with that, we've reached the end of the video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.